On the Ground, presented by The Cube. Here's your host, Jeff Frick. Hey, welcome back everybody. Jeff Frick here. We are on the ground at the Santa Clara Convention Center at the Open Networking Summit 2016. It's kind of the season of open shows. We were at Open Compute Project Summit last week. And again, wanted to come down, kind of see what's going on and uh, really excited to talk to Calvin Chai from Pika 8. Welcome, Calvin. Thanks, Jeff. Good to be here. Absolutely. So, like I said, we were just at OCP. Right. Talked to James from Pika 8, so I, I kind of cheated. I got a little <laughs> update from him just, just last week. And now you guys are here at ONS. For the folks at home, what's the difference between OCP, ONS? How are the two related? Why is Pika 8 at both? We're both open, right? Well, so, that's that, it's a season of open shows. <laughs> so, I mean, that's, that's a great question. Um, open Compute is really about, for us anyway, um, you, you heard the, the talks last week, it was all about the interface of the hardware, right? How, is, how are we submitting designs from an open source standpoint for the hardware? Um, and, and from PK8 standpoint, we've done a lot of, of work in that regard, like how do you port to ASICs faster? How do you make um, you know, memory space allocations better with ASICs? So that's all really important for us. The other aspect of that is how do you interface with the apps? So for us, open networking is all about the apps. And you know, if you think about it, it's about how do you customize the network for the apps and not the other way around, right? Um, if every app was the same, then this would be a really easy problem to solve because you'd have the same application characteristics, you'd be able to build the exact same networks, with, you know, you'd just be able to go down to Cisco, Juniper, Arista, whatever your networking vendor of choice, pull down these boxes and build the network that you need. But the reality is that with all the application customization that's happening, with all the diversity and the types of apps that we see out there, it's a lot harder to do that. So you need to have some custom networking components as well. Yes, it's interesting, open source for hardware versus open source for software, which everybody's familiar with, and, and actually the Linux Foundation now has taken over yeah. Open Networking Summit. But in hardware, it's a little different, it's a little different animal, because you know, you're, you're trying to come up with kind of a, a set of standards that people can build to, but you still have to have competitive differentiation. So how do you kind of straddle that challenge? <laughs> Yeah, that, that is different, and, th and there isn't, I mean, it's probably an oversimplification how we make that demarcation line, um, but for us, it, it actually works out really well because we actually sit right on that middle part, right? So we build the hardware operating system, Picos, that sits on that open compute standard hardware, and we also have the interfaces, we also you know, support the protocols that you need to communicate with that application ecosystem. So when we think about the applications, it's not just the app, it's the SDN controllers that you have to think about, it's the automation platforms, it's the management platforms. So there's a whole slew of these different components that you need to talk to, um, and that's really where the interfaces come in that we, that we support. It's interesting, there's always conversation, you know, the three basic components of compute, you know, store compute and networking, right. and that networking was really kind of the last, <laughs> kind of the, the last one at SDN, uh, you know, coming around, but software is finally getting into networking, and those kind of uh, all-in-one boxes are being broken up right. uh, into pieces, and as you're saying, it's really a function of applications of being able to morph to this rapidly developing app world with DevOps, et cetera. That's right, Jeff, you've just actually just described the network gap and we, we call it that because if you think about how new applications and services come online, if you have an application developer or a programmer, you can actually spin up an application pretty quickly, right? You just write some software, you compile it, roll it out, off you go. To make a networking change of the same magnitude takes a lot longer cycle, uh, at least traditionally. And so there's this gap that exists because you know you have to wait for the you know a new ASIC to be run off the, the fabrication line, or you'd have to wait for a new version of the operating system code. But now that that's all been disaggregated, you can actually close that gap. And furthermore, with SDN protocols, you can actually make the communication between the application and the networking component a lot more uh, a lot more tight as well. So that that's really helpful to close that gap. Yeah, James had a great line, and you, you expanded on it since we've been here, you know, about before you would have to make everything fit your network. You didn't right. have the flexibility in the network, so your storage had to fit the network, and you took it up a notch. It's really now you can make your network fit your application versus making your application fit your network. Pretty important in the world in which we live with DevOps, fast-moving oh. application space, API-based economy, really a huge enabler. Yeah, and that's exactly what you need to do, right? Because if you, you know, one thing that if you've walked around the, the show floor is what one thing that you've noticed is that the degree of customization required for these applications is pretty intense, 
right? If you, um, you know, one of the themes of the show that I've noticed so far this year is that we've moved from science projects and proof of concepts to real production, but there aren't cookie cutters. I, I mentioned this before in terms of everybody's application is different, right? So how do you build the infrastructure to support that? You really need to have, you know, malleable, dynamic, um, you know, open networking components that you can actually like change on the fly. Um, and as an example of that, we've got um, a demonstration with a company called Cool Cloud. That's actually um, downstairs. And what we're doing is it's a really simple example. It's a cloud bursting example where, you know, when you're thinking about provisioning uh, capabilities and uh, resources on demand, you really need to be able to call on that quickly, right? So if, some, if there's like some kind of a congestion event, for instance, and you need to spin up another um, instance of that application, how do you do that quickly? Um, in this particular demo, what we're doing is we're using the Picos with an uh, open, data, o uh, open flow controller with a cool cloud software, spin up another virtualized instance from somewhere totally across in another network. It's not even next to it. Um, and then you can actually get that bandwidth that you need. And when you're done, you turn it off, right? So it's, it's a very simple cloud value proposition, but we're starting to see the reality of these types of use cases come to life using SDN and standard networking. It's a simple value proposition, but it is at the crux of the cloud revolution, really right? It's hard to do with standard networking. Uh, absolutely, because it's all about having capacity on demand. That's so right. whether you can plan it, like you're running a Pepsi commercial in the Super Bowl, right? right. The classic example, or it just got, uh, you had the other, other Super Bowl that had a lot more traffic <laughs> than they anticipated <laughs> and, a couple and, years back. And that's the thing, right? Is because you can't, you can't always predict because what the provider wants to provide the consumer is you dictate when you want that demand. Right? It's not I'm provisioning it for you, but you, know, you want to be able to turn that up from a consumer standpoint. So the customer, you can't predict when their usage patterns are going to have happen all the time. So you need to be prepared for that. Right. Um, and so that's, that's really kind of the interesting thing. Uh, one other thing I want to add really quick is, sure. is that you know, one of the biggest misconceptions about open networking and SDN is that you have to like rip apart your entire old networking infrastructure to make this new, new model work. That's, not true at all. In, in fact, you know, if you think about it, there's there's been 25 years in the networking industry. These routing protocols have, are really mature. They, they're very robust and stable. These things work really well. Um, what we're advocating is think about how to integrate SDN into those environments so that if you do have a specific problem that's a problem that's difficult to solve, whether it's dynamic VPN provisioning, whether it's cloud bursting or something like that, that's where you bring in the policy that you can make um, with SDN. Well, let's unpack that a little bit deeper. So are you saying if you've got kind of an existing infrastructure based on stuff you've had for a while and you want to start to add this capability, you can basically put your stuff as kind of an overlay layer to then draw off those existing resources or is it like a separate pool that's then available on the more flexible basis? Yeah, it's well, it's exact, that's a great question. Um, that That's the thing is because a lot of folks won't want to throw away their investment, right? It's, it's time consuming, there's a lot of OpEx involved, plus there's so much institutional knowledge that's built up over time. Sure. It's like, hey, I know how BGP works, I know how MPLS networks work. Uh, no, you absolutely don't throw that away because that stuff works for um, you know what, what they're being used for. Um, in certain cases though, if you want to do, for example, fast multicast convergence, if you're trying to spin up a services gateway, if you're trying to roll services out to the edge, um, rolling fiber to the home, for instance, these things um, are sometimes easier to be done on a, on a fast basis using SDN protocols in conjunction with those things. So it's not like you're turning them off, you're actually doing exception-based forwarding as, in, in, as opposed to bulk-based forwarding. Okay, so you've been in the business for a little while. Mm -hmm. um, before you were at, at PK, you've been in networking. So what's, what's kind of next? In the next six months, nine months, 12 months, what's kind of the next mountain that you guys are trying to climb? Yeah, no, it's really interesting. Um, you know, from last year to this year, we're already starting to see a lot more production deployments. I think I mentioned that before. So, you know, a lot of these cloud service providers, whether it's infrastructure or content providers, and even some large enterprises are, are rolling these things out. Um, the customization is key. So for us, it's going to be to continue to work with partners. It's going to continue to work with OEMs. It's going to be to continue to work with existing networks out there to how we can add value to those existing networks using our operating system, using open networking concepts, using OpenFlow. Okay, I was going to let you go, but now <laughs> you just made me think of one more question. The ecosystem, right? It's a very yes. different model when you're leveraging an ecosystem model. And, and we yep. go to a lot of shows, and most of the shows we go to 
our shows because the, the supporting company has a large and vibrant ecosystem. Mm -hmm. How is a, a ecosystem involvement really changing the network game versus kind of a closed system you bought either box uh, A or box B? Yeah, um, well I think the, the interesting thing is open source, right? Um, that That's always been one of the things is um, it's a little bit of a double-edged sword because you know you release something to the open open source ecosystem, and you know there's 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 actually a lot of communities out there right now, and I think there's probably a little bit of confusion in the marketplace as to how all these things fit together. Right. So I think that'll be the biggest challenge. One of the bigger challenges moving forward is to you know kind of really understand where all these um, ecosystem players play, um, and usually you know, when when you when you open source something. Like the idea is sound, but it takes some iterations before you know you come up with the the real um, how should I say this the, like the robust or or like this is the right solution right, right? right It's almost like here's the design now you ten ten groups go out and figure out like how to build it and there's ten different implementations and over time that process evolves until you get like a really nice one. Um, and I think that's what's going to happen here in the no open networking space. Okay, yeah. It's always that trade-off between speed of innovation with a lot of people contributing, then, but you can't have too many <laughs> too many projects for the commercial customers, exactly. right? They're like, ah, yeah. what am I supposed Find to do? Find a number of developers, right? <laughs> Absolutely. All right, Calvin Chai, thanks for stopping by and sharing some of your insight. Yeah, thanks, Jeff. Absolutely. All right, Jeff Frick with Calvin Chai from PK. We are live uh, at the Open Networking Summit in Santa Clara, California. Thanks for watching.